meeting and welcome to the Justice Committee's 16th meeting of 2018. Uh, I have apologies from convener Margaret Mitchell and Jenny Gilruth and I welcome Stuart Stevenson who is substituting uh, today for Jenny. Agenda item one on, is our fourth evidence session on the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill. I refer members to paper one which is a note by the clerk and paper two which is a private paper. So good morning, I'd like to welcome our, our first panel who is David Strang, Her Majesty's Chief Inspector, Her Majesty's Inspector of Prisons for Scotland, Chief Superintendent Gary McEwen, Divisional Commander, Criminal Justice Services Division, Police Scotland, Ruth Ingalls, Director of Development and Innovation, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, and Roddy Flynn, Legal Secretary to the Lord President. And I'd like to thank those who've provided written evidence, it's very useful. Uh, so we can move straight to questions now. I'll start with Daniel. Thank you, Convener, and good morning uh, to the panel. Um, in broad terms, uh, and I'm going to be asking about electronic tagging, uh, in terms of the, the, the bill it's set out, it, it's broadly to do two things. First of all, to update for new technologies, and secondly, I think, as part of the context of trying to keep people out of prison, so whereby uh, ordinarily someone might not be able to be released, that, that the tagging can perhaps provide the, 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 the security that is required. However, there's been some concern stated by some, including the, the, the Howard League, that, that it could lead to simply a situation where people who would otherwise be you know, uh, allowed non-custodial sentences or, or released may just simply be up-tariffed. Uh, I was just wondering what the panel's thoughts were on that and how we prevent a situation where simply we, 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 we tag people who otherwise would be out of prison. Can we start with David Strang? Shall I begin? Thank you very much uh, indeed. I think I'd want to uh, begin by just commenting on the very high levels of imprisonment we have in Scotland. Uh, in my view, disproportionate and unnecessarily high. We're the second highest per head of population in the whole of Europe, um, uh, outdone only by England and Wales. Um, so my own view is that we imprison too many people, particularly for short sentences. Prison is absolutely necessary for those who have committed serious crimes and who pose a serious threat um, to the public. And you know, the purpose of the criminal justice system is to reduce crime, to keep people safe, to reduce the number of, of victims. Um, and I think our use um, of short-term imprisonment is, um, contributes to an increase in crime. It actually makes us as a society in Scotland less safe, not more safe, by, by locking people up for, for short periods. Um, and I, I gave evidence uh, before you in, in January on the use of remand. Um, about a fifth of people in prison in Scotland today are unconvicted, uh, untried. They are, they are on remand. Um, so to answer your question, I welcome the use of electronic monitoring where it will reduce um, uh, the use of imprisonment and particularly uh, I, I, um, thinking about remand uh, which I would support, um, but also uh, encouraging uh, early release back into the community and as a, dis as a disposal from the court um, that would be seen as, as an effective uh, response to, to the crime and offending behaviour people should be dealt with by the court. And uh, the use of electronic monitoring as, as an uh, add-on to community payback or as part of it, I think is, is a useful means, uh, as long as it is an an alternative to someone being in custody. And, and so behind your question is a suggestion that um, courts might just add it on as a way of um, uh, sort of ensuring that, that someone stays out of trouble. I think there is a risk that the Howard League for Scotland is right, that there's a, there's a potential risk that it could, um, if it widens too far, people who otherwise would, have, would not have been and caught and, and returned to custody might be. Um, so I think the implementation of this is important that people uh, are supported, have supervision in the community. Uh, it's not just the tag alone, but, but it's, it's the support that they might need, particularly if they have um, addictions, problems, mental health, and, and so on, that they will need support in the community to keep them out of the uh, criminal justice system. I'd be interested if the other members of the panel reflect those uh, comments. Yeah, I, I don't disagree at all with anything that's just been commented upon. You know, I think the serious high-risk offenders and criminals should, if the court decide, they should be kept in, in custody and should serve a, a, a term of imprisonment. 
However, those that are on remand or the lower level offences, it does have a significant and massive disruption to family, employment, housing and all these other associated by taking that individual for a short period of remand. I do think it's important to note though, that this is electronic monitoring and it is not control. So this is not a catch-all. This will not prevent re-offending. This will just monitor somebody's behaviour uh, more likely in a sort of retrospective fashion. I do think electronic monitoring is definitely a, a tactic and a innovative practice that we should be considering, but it should definitely suit the needs of the offender, and there should be wraparound with other sort of measures in place to support that individual. It can't just be used as an isolation; it has to be used with other with other tactics that we have with partners, etc. Well, that was courts and tribunal service. I'd just like to start by uh, thanking the committee um, for inviting SCTS to give evidence today. Uh, by way of introduction, if I could also just say that I'm appearing on behalf of SCTS in its role of providing efficient and effective administration to the courts, and my views don't reflect the views of the judiciary. And my comments will very much be confined to considering the operational impact on the courts um, and not delving into matters of policy. So I'm not sure there's anything that I could usefully add in response to that question. Okay. Well, perhaps maybe if I could just go back to David Strang. In, in your written submission, you uh, highlight some concerns around consistency. I was just wondering maybe if you could I explain what those concerns are and perhaps maybe set out some of your thoughts about how that consistency could be Im improved. And, and again, I, mean, I think I, I would presume that that, that would in, in turn relate a little bit to my in initial question about actually ensuring that it is used to help people get out of prison as opposed to tagging people who would already be out. My comments in relation to consistency is about the support that's available for people across Scotland in different local authority areas. I'm thinking about bail uh, supervision um, and clearly different courts will tend to um, um, use community payback orders in different ways. The, the support available isn't necessarily consistent uh, in every local authority and, and for every court. So um, that was what my comments were in relation to the, 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 um, the, the support that is available for people in the community does vary across Scotland. I mean, could I maybe put that point to the, the courts and tribunal service? I mean, one of the things that we've heard a number of times, uh, both on, on this but also in terms of remand, is that we have uh, variation between different areas really based on, on what sheriffs are aware of as being available and, and what, what is uh, open to them. What steps can be taken to ensure that that full information is there and therefore that this uh, legislation would be used uh, as much or as, as effectively as possible um, if it's passed? I suppose in terms of um, ensuring consistency and availability, um, it might amount to additional training um, in terms of to staff training and also judicial training. So that's where I could see that that would impact on the, the court service and that in turn would require additional funding. Okay. And do you think that funding is, is contained within what has been set out and particularly in the financial memorandum? Do you think there's adequate levels of funding for that? Well, in, in terms of what's currently in the bill, we did contribute to the financial um, memorandum um, and we assumed a 50% increase in the number of relevant orders um, with an associated increase um, in breaches and miscellaneous applications. Um, the costs of that were um, estimated in the region of £800,000 per annum for the sheriff courts and in the region of £9,500 for JP courts. Um, there are very few orders made in the high court. Um, so the, the, the financial memorandum is structured around what the, the, the bill provisions contain at the moment, and it reflects a fair estimate um, of the costs. So if I could just ask one final question to, to uh, Gary McEwen. You, you said in your first response um, that this, this is very much about monitoring rather than actually preventing uh, behaviours. But by the same token, 
you could foresee a situation where if this is successful and is being used, it could lead to an increase in, in your workload because you're actually having to respond to the behaviours which are, are flagged up for, for people who are out of prison who might have otherwise been inside. Is there, what, 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 what operational changes uh, do, you, do you foresee this uh, impacting on, on you and the police more widely in terms of having to follow up on, on, on uh, electronically monitored uh, uh, prisoners? So we do think that there will be some back, additional back office support required to update the, the various PNC and CHS systems, but it is, it's not going to be significant. I mean, you are talking penny numbers of, of staff, maybe one or two additional members of staff, dependent upon the, the throughput. Whether electronic monitoring is considered for bails, then we would estimate that that would again have a a greater increase in the, in the back office workload because there's many thousands of bails across the country. So if this was considered, then that would require some administration. But the reality around those that they are thereafter sort of breach the monitoring, mm -hmm. the, the process as is now is that we don't have a power of arrest for the, the current restriction of liberty orders or the, the home detention curfews. That then goes back to the court who then uh, if they choose to do so, if, the, if there has been a breach reported to them, then there's a warrant issued, and that's where the impact would be on police officers, because uh, the officers across the country would then embark upon uh, arresting these individuals in warrant and present them back to the court. So that would have an impact, but that's if, if individuals breach these uh, retrospective uh, curfews and orders. I mean, have you done any sort of assessment into what the impact that might have in terms of response officers? Is we haven't, no. Mr. Flynn, would you like to comment on anything that you've heard? No, nothing further so far. Fine. A supplementary from John Finney. Yep. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, the, the, the government have indicated uh, um, that they would hope the monitoring requirements, monitoring requirements, would be appropriate to circumstances. They also talk about a, a response framework to ensure consistency of approach. Now. Are you able to comment on what judgment, it was helpful, Mr McEwen, to, to hear your comment about what happens at the moment. Um, would you imagine the police to be involved in putting together some framework yourself, Mr Strang, perhaps, Ms Ingalls? Uh, I, would, I would certainly be interested in getting involved in, in the discussion, but the vast majority of this is, is more for, for the prisons and, and the courts. It's them that, you know, for the home detention curfews, it's the prison service that, that issue those curfews, and the police really are, are sort of at the, the latter end of it, should individuals breach them, and the reports have been submitted and, and warrants and warrants issued. So uh, the reality is it's more for the prisons and the courts, I think. Yes, and um, for social work who will be supervising it in the community. So, um, uh, um, Gary McEwen mentioned about thousands of bail decisions, and they are, but, but I wouldn't anticipate that those people will be eligible or be envisaged for electronic monitoring. This is about people who otherwise would have been remanded in custody. So, the numbers uh, won't, won't be massive. Hopefully, that it will be a, a, a small number who otherwise would have been in custody but with the introduction of electronic monitoring, we'll be able to uh, remain in the community. And it'll, it'll impact, I think, more on social work and support agencies in the community. Thank you. Ms. Ingalls, would, would you have a comment in particular when you were talked about the figures are put together, if you consider a gender aspect to that? We've had representations about the disproportionate impact that uh, this electronic monitoring could have on women, particularly with regard to um, child caring responsibilities and what that would mean for the, the children being effectively confined to the house too? Um, in terms of that particular aspect of data that you're talking about and the impact on women, um, that's not something that I have data on. Um, and I'm, not, I'm also not sure that that is something that SCTS could provide data on. Um, the way that our... Um, case management systems are, are set up. Um, they're set up on the basis of operational needs as opposed to doing any um, research or statistical analysis. Um, so there are limitations to what we could provide in terms of data on that. Okay, finally, in relation to this, the development of this response framework, have 
your service been involved in the, the development of that? I, I have no detail about the, the response framework. Okay. Thank you very much. And from Stuart Stevenson. Um, my question, I think, is for Mr Strang, um, and it's about the statistics. And, of course, they may not be your statistics, so it may be you can't answer. Uh, you said that Scotland has the second highest uh, number of people in prison, and England and Wales is the highest. Um, but a fifth of them are on remand. In looking at the figures uh, in other parts of Europe, do they include remand uh, prisoners is the first part of the question. Um, and conscious of the fact that in other jurisdictions, remand prisoners can quite often be held separately in things like bail hostels, which are restrictions on liberty, but not prison. Um, are the figures as comparable as you, your answer to us would suggest? There are um, international standards for, for comparisons across the globe, and uh, as you would understand, there are potentially different counting mechanisms, but it is um, accepted this figure of, of uh, prison population per 100,000 of the population. So, so it, it's not absolute numbers, it's, it's comparisons with mm. the, the size mm. of the population. The European average is about 100 per 100,000. Um, you mentioned Scandinavian countries. They imprison about 60, 70. Um, Scotland is about 130. England about 140. So um, there may be... Um, kind of minor definitions, I think one of the issues um, can be um, psychiatric patients and whether people are held in a, in a hospital setting or in, in a secure hospital setting or in a, in a prison environment. So there will be some um, potential variations at the margins, but in terms of the broad scope that we imprison on average 50% more of our population uh, than the European average, I think is an accurate figure. But if, uh, if all the Roman prisoners were uh, not to be held in prison, but instead uh, released on uh, some form of tagging, we'd be down to, my quick arithmetic says, 105. Yes, but there's absolutely no suggestion that no one will be held on remand. I'm not arguing that every prisoner on remand, if someone oh, is so charged with a very yeah. serious offence, they absolutely need to be locked up from the day of uh, arrest through the court if they're convicted and kept in, in custody for a long time. So I just think it's important not to think that I'm arguing that all people on remand in prison should be uh, held on, on a, a, an electronic monitor, not, not at all. So I'm talking about uh, a, a certain proportion of these who I think could be uh, better supported in the community with support and w with tagging. It can be ensured that they turn up at court. I think and quite a lot of people, including uh, women, as Mr Finney was on, asking about, are remanded to ensure that the court case can go ahead. And I understand that. So I, I think there, there, there's a smaller number than the 100% of people uh, on remand. If, if I may, I was merely seeking to explore the limitations. In other words, to get down to the European average requires a lot more than simply dealing with remand prisoners. That was all I was trying no, to do. No, absolutely. Yeah, and I just wanted to put on the record I wasn't coming from the point of view you might have said, th okay. thought I was. And, and, and for me, it's also about um, prison sentences, and yeah. I'm a big supporter of the presumption against short sentences. Thank you. Short supplementary from Liam before we move on. I was just following up, I think it was Mr. Shang who was talking about um, the additional workload pressures applied to um, social work departments as a result of the, um, the electronic monitoring. And I mean, I don't think there'll be a social work department in the country which is not already experiencing severe workload issues. So I was just wondering whether it may not be for this panel, maybe more for the minister and others to, to determine. But in your view, is there a risk inherent within this that? Um, we may be applying uh, yet further pressure to an already uh, burdened service that will make the, the success of electronic monitoring uh, more difficult to achieve. I don't have a view on, on resourcing of, of uh, social work services, but taking a long view, if, if um, we accept that this is likely to lead to fewer people being uh, imprisoned, a reduction in crime overall, then in, in the longer term this is the right thing to do and we'll reduce uh, the impact on on police courts, prisons, and criminal justice social work. Okay. Thank you, Liam. Would you like to ask your? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, just 
turning to, to the issue of, or, or expanding the issue to, to cover um, alcohol and, and drug testing as well, I was just wondering with the panel's views on, on the kind of primary motives and, and benefits around this. Is it about more flexibility for, for the, the, the courts to, to deal with um, uh, those who come before them, um, a greater reassurance to the, to the public? Um, or in, in terms of alcohol drug monitoring about supporting efforts um, towards the assistance on the part of, of, of people who have uh, addiction issues. I'm just wondering whether there's a, a view as to whether there's a kind of primary motive behind this or it's a blend of, of, of a range of different benefits. If I, if I could start, I, for me there's a parallel with the drug treatment and testing orders which are overseen by the courts as part of the criminal justice um, system. But if you speak to people who are on the DTO, they find the discipline of that uh, supervision and support and appearing before the sheriff um, helpful in terms of trying to, to manage addictions. Um, I, as you know, um, the levels of addiction of, of people going through our courts is very high. People say that you know more than 50% of people in prison say they were drunk at the time of committing their offence. So you know we we know that that addictions, whether drug or alcohol, there's a huge correlation with offending and and people's lifestyle and so on. Um, I think we can take encouragement from the fact that DTTOs, which is a, 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 a disposal of the court, is seen as supportive. And I think for me to answer your question that. The potential for electronic monitoring with, with, for um, uh, alcohol is about adding some additional um, supervision um, and support for people who are are trying to to change their ways as they as they would need to be. They can, it can only be a voluntary um, uh, disposal, and um, it, it, it seems to me that that um, it's not about catching people out and more punishment, but it's about uh, having information that can be helpful in terms of supporting them so that you're more likely to get a better outcome in the long run. And is there a balance in that? I mean, I'll ask Mr McEwen in a second for his thoughts on that, but is there a balance here in terms of um, ensuring that the, the measures we're applying do not um, uh, become so intrusive that they create other issues in terms of um, for example, the data and, and, and whatnot that we have on, on individuals and, and as, as a consequence, the, the way in which that data is stored and, and shared. I understand that, but there's, there's nothing in our criminal justice system more intrusive than sending someone to prison. So they're taken from their home. If they have a job, they lose that. Um, break relationships with families and they're incarcerated in a prison for however long. So that is the most intrusive, you know, the, the highest level of intrusion that the criminal justice system has. So your right to raise you know, data and information issues um, as potentially in intrusive, but it's n it, it, as an alternative to being incarcerated in prison, it is a, it's a much lower level of intrusion. Those issues will need to be looked at, clearly, um, uh, but I don't think it's a barrier to using um, uh, electronic monitoring in this way as an alternative to custody. So, do you have a, a view on that? Uh, really, again, to probably mirror what's just been said, alcohol and drugs are a, you know, a significant causation factor to a lot of crime that happens out in the communities of Scotland. So if this is an alternative and an additional wraparound to monitoring individuals that have a propensity to commit crime or have committed crime whilst under the influence of alcohol or drugs, then a monitoring system could very well be advantageous. It could uh, address their needs and protect the public in a retrospective fashion. So as an alternative to them uh, being in prison for short term sentences, I think this is certainly a viable option. And, and are there concerns that in terms of GPS availability that this is a disposal that's going to be available in some parts of the country but not necessarily all parts of the country and is that, a, um, is that something we should be concerned about or, or, or is the expectation that the technology will allow us to uh, apply these measures um, across the entire country, remote and rural areas um, included? I'm not sure about that level of detail. I mean, I hear the discussions around uh, GPS not being great in some areas of Scotland and being better in, in urban and, and rural. So that, that is worthy of further uh, sort of discussion. I mean, I suppose it's partly the technological issue. It's partly the issue of geography as well. 
um, I presume that there's a consideration to be given that um, where somebody's being electronically monitored, it's a, it's a management of a, a, of a risk issue. If, for example, you're in an island setting like um, the, the ones I represent, uh, there may be concerns amongst your colleagues, Mr McEwen, that um, that monitoring is going on in somewhere where there isn't a, a police presence um, and therefore the ability to respond to issues um, is, is uh, it's something that's more challenging to, to achieve. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's, a, that, that's something that will be a factor in terms of the decisions taken about the use of it? I think it would, would be interesting to see the, the technological advancements because that, and I, you know, it will not be missed on you that I, it is monitoring, so it is not control and it is retrospective. So if somebody does uh, not adhere to the curfew bail, you know, we are not aware of that in real time. That that becomes apparent many hours, if not longer, later via whatever the the you know the. The company is that then reports that matter. So the question for me is, what is the individual doing during that period of time that he or she is breaching whatever the curfew or the, the conditions are? So it is not real time control; it is monitoring, but it is retrospective monitoring. Unless there is technological advancements there that would bring that to the fore quicker, which I think would be really important. Mm -hmm. Just briefly on the on the issue of. of Data protection. We touched on it briefly before. There, there is um, sort of provisions within the bill granting ministers' powers to, to set this by by regulation. Um, it, is it the panel's view that that's sufficient? Um, we've obviously got a range of different um, parties that would be involved in the in, in, in the process around electronic monitoring, um, who may require to to share that data. That's going to be a mix of public, possibly voluntary, and indeed private companies um, operating in this area. Does that give rise to any particular concerns on, 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 your, on your view? Certainly not of any of the information I've read. No, I think we need to uh, share that information as widely as possible uh, within the, the remits of the legislation. So uh, I'm comfortable that that is certainly, if not being done, certainly being covered and discussed. Is your, is your question about ministers being able to make regulations for data protection rather than it coming to the parliament for legislation, well, do you mean? It, I mean, it's a combination of, of, of both. Clearly, the, the, the concerns that be addressed around um, data protection, the way information is shared, is, is, is taken up in the bill within um, guidance that is to follow. And yeah. there's an ongoing debate about um, the level of scrutiny there is of that, of that process. Um, so I suppose the question is, did, do we need something more explicit on the face of the bill about how this would be uh, handled, um, or are you are you comfortable that that, that this process will arrive at a a, 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 a solution that um, will address the, the concerns that inevitably arise around the way in which data is shared? I, I think the latter. I think I think it's sensible to have the ability to um, introduce. Um, procedures, protocols for, for, for data sharing and storage and so on. And as we know, you know, uh, the electronic world is changing very rapidly and it may be, you know, I don't think you would want to come back to Parliament to legislate every, every time there's some new app or new way of, of sharing information. So I, I think that's sufficient. But I think you're right that there's an issue about what happens to this data. Um, that, you know, the, the companies that are, are responsible for electronic monitoring, particularly with GPS and, uh, you know, if they've got the the alcohol monitoring bracelets, there'll, there'll be a huge amount of, of data that is captured. And I think it's really important that there is um, sufficient oversight uh, and scrutiny of, of what happens to that data. And it, 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 you don't think that would require, even though I, I take absolutely the point you make about um, the way in which technology change and the issues that, that, that may arise from that are, are going to evolve over time. But there's not more of a need to set out broader principles that one would imagine will adhere for um, some time to come in terms of the way in which that data is used and shared? Uh, not in my view. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask Ruth uh, Ingalls, please, is, is, does the court service have protocols and are you planning on changing your protocols with regard to data uh, sharing, you know, given the new regulations? Um, 
Can I just ask you which regulations? You, well, the new, you, the new regulations mean? coming into force on Friday. I mean, have you got? Are, are you changing your practice in any way? The GDPR. Regulations? Oh, the GDPR. Yeah. Oh, right. Sorry. 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 Yeah. Um, um, yes. Um, we, the the um, the courts are responding to the GDPR and implementing um, various practices um, in order to ensure that the court service is. Um, um, following the, the, the new regime. Um, I'm not in a position to provide much detail on that, but I can certainly um, write to the committee if that would be helpful yes, or if helpful, there's any you. particular aspects of it that you have concerns about, then... It was just a general view as to what you were having to do regarding okay. that. So if you could just update us, that would okay. be great. Supplementary from Stuart Stevenson. Um, just thought it would be useful if we put on the record uh, a little bit, since we've talked about GPS. GPS actually works better in rural areas than it does in urban areas, because to get a two-dimensional fix, you need to see three satellites. And in urban areas, buildings will obscure the, the view of satellites, whereas in rural areas, they do not. Albeit that most of the GPS-enabled equipment also has supplementary uh, fixing using mobile phones and they have uh, devices that enable them to interpolate between adjacent GPS captures. But basically, it actually works better in rural areas than urban, and it's just important we don't get uh, uh, away with the idea that it's otherwise. Thank you. Uh, Liam Kerr. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask the uh, witnesses about uh, resourcing. Um, before I do, Mr. Strang, can I just uh, ask you, Stuart Stevenson, in another one of his very interesting interventions earlier on, was asking about the, the stats, and you said that the stats, were, the, the stats on prison numbers were broadly comparable across Europe. Uh, and that within that, uh, within those stats, uh, the number of remand prisoners are included. Uh, you said earlier we're running at about 20% of the prison population is on remand. Do you have any idea of whether those levels are equivalent in the other European jurisdictions? Uh, so, for example, are there significantly less people on remand throughout the rest of Europe in those stats? Um, the answer to your question is I, I don't have those statistics. It's um, Beck College at London University, the International Prison Centre, who put out the statistics on, uh, and they do uh, comparable, and uh, not just across Europe, but across the globe, and that, that is all available there. But I personally, sitting here, do not know what the comparable uh, remand rates are in, in other countries. Thank you. So, uh, moving on to the general resources. Uh, this electronic monitoring could be, or will be, uh, a pretty significant change in terms of how we do things, and there will be a call on the resources uh, that will be required to do that. So that might include the actual equipment, uh, the training of staff to do this, uh, the, the way the courts operate, for example, the social work departments that Liam MacArthur looked at earlier. So, do any of the witnesses have any views on whether this whole area has been appropriately costed uh, and if sufficient resources will be made available? Uh, Mr McEwen, can I throw that to you? Certainly can. The, so as I mentioned earlier, we, we have looked at the what we anticipate will be the back office support requirements, but it is not significant. The bit that we have yet to fully understand <coughs> is the impact that the the tail end of the the uh, the pipe, if you like, the pipeline, where those individuals that that breach the electronic monitoring, what, and then if there are reports going into the sheriffs to then issue warrants, etc., will that increase as a consequence of that? We are not sure, and we are needing to do some more evaluation to try and understand that. But it is very difficult because these individuals currently are or a, a fair proportion are, are in the prison, or will would have normally or previously been put in prison, so if they're now coming out in electronic monitoring, what is the likelihood of them breaching that is, is really sort of finger in the air stuff, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Mr Strong. Well, my uh, answer is about a long-term costing. So one prison place for a year costs £35,000 roughly. 
So if you're reducing the number of people who are occupying prison beds, um, then there's clearly an economic benefit. Now, um, I'm sure the Scottish Prison Service would like me to say this, but so, so it doesn't free it up immediately, not saying that you know, one person fewer, they can then hand over £35,000 a year. But in terms of us as a society, it is much, much more expensive to keep someone in prison than to supervise them on electronic monitoring. So the, I suppose that there needs to be a kind of spend to save because if you are investing in community supervision, um, that is successful and reduces uh, the number of people in prison, then that, that frees up and there needs to be a resource shift in my mind. I mean, this is, this is a much broader issue, but we need a resource shift from spending on prisons and custody into community disposals and community support. Um, so it's, it's a longer term solution. Thank you. And for the court service? In terms of um, resources, as I mentioned earlier, we have contributed to the financial memorandum and I mentioned the figures of uh, the costs being approximately 800,000 per annum for the sheriff court and 9,500 in the GP courts. Um, what I didn't mention was the, um, the additional new intimation duty uh, which schedule one of the bill places on the clerk of court. That will have resource implications for SCTS and again we indicated in the financial memorandum that Taking into account the anticipated increase in the number of community disposals that will be made in consequence of the bill, and estimating that 20% of relevant community disposals relate to persons who are already subject to an existing order, then there will be um, SETS costs, um, additional staff time costs of around £232,000 per annum. So the, I think in terms of your question of whether um, it's been sufficiently costed. I think the aspects, the disposals that are currently listed in clause three of the bill have been sufficiently costed from our perspective. However, it's, um, if the, the list of disposals is extended by way of regulation making powers, um, if and when that happens, um, those will need to be costed by SCTS as well. Because if the list of disposals is extended to include things like electronic monitoring as an alternative to remand or as an alternative to fines, then those do have significant resource implications for SCTS. And we'd need to have time to cost those and also time to ensure that the enable funding, the funding was um, available for it. But that way may well come further down the line when, when and if the regulation making powers are exercised by ministers. So would it be fair to say then that that exercise hasn't, it is not possible to say at this stage, this is how much this change is going to cost the country. And specifically, Mr. MacArthur's point earlier about the social work uh, departments, that, ha that exercise hasn't been done. I can only comment obviously on SCTS. Mm. Um, in terms of what is in the bill at the moment, in clause three, um, and, and, and which lists the disposals that are available, I feel that th that has been costed for SETS. However, if ministers choose to exercise their enabling powers further down the line and add to the list of disposals, um, bringing in things like electro uh, electronic monitoring as an alternative to remand or as an alternative to fines, then the details of that has, haven't been costed. We, we, we provided... Um, estimates in our response to the consultation on that and um, so looking at um, electronic monitoring as an alternative to fines um, we were coming in with figures of 2.2 million pounds per annum so you can see that there could potentially be a, a, a big impact on SCTS and so we need to be involved fully in the costing of those further down the line. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's just say that there are Fairly significant costs, and I do accept what Mr. Strang says about you're almost front-loading that cost for a payback later. Uh, but where is that resource going to come from? Do any of you have any idea? And specifically, Mr. Strang, is there any suggestion that it could come from the prison service? I mean, it's not for me to, to comment on, on resourcing. I mean, my job as Chief Inspector of Prisons is to inspect prisons and report on the conditions and the treatment of people in prison. Um, so I, I suppose I'm, I just see it as a, as a bigger challenge that we need 
to shift more resourcing into prevention and support and less on, on um, uh, imprisonment and at, kind of at the punishment end. Um, but, but, but as with any um, you know, funding decision, it's a, it's a political decision about priorities. And I mean, you know, politicians have to decide about health and education and justice. And I, I'm just advocating that um, more investment in electronic monitoring and supervision in the community will in the long run produce uh, better outcomes for society, lower crime rates, and will save money in the long run because we will be incarcerating fewer people. So it makes sense for me both in the short and the longer term. Does anyone else have any comments on where that resource would come from? For example, in the, the court service, you've laid out some fairly clear costs. Uh, have you any idea where that money is going to come from? Well, we, yes, we have laid out the, the, the costs and if we are required to implement, implement that po policy, we would hope that the funding would be made available for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maurice Corey. Thank you, Good morning, panel. Um, we've received evidence highlighting the importance of decisions about electronic monitoring having been made on professional assessment uh, of support needs and risks to others. Does the panel have uh, regarding certain types of offending, such as domestic abuse, uh, give rise to particular difficulties with this type of monitoring uh, in particular? Mr. McEwen. Do I have a concern that I... Yeah. I mean, do you think it's actually going to uh, help? I mean, is it going to be more problematic with domestic abuse? The fact no. they're in the community, they're around, okay, they're monitored. I'm talking about the, 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 um, the guilty party, should we say. Yeah, I mean, domestic abuse is, is not my absolute area of expertise, but no, I mean, I think it goes back to the, the original points. The serious and violent offenders should be kept in prison. There is no doubt about that in my, in my mind. But those that are uh, committing other offences that are less serious, then we perhaps do need to have a a different and more innovative approach to that and electronic monitoring seems to be one viable option but it really has to be around a wrap around i mean some of the the bill talks about sex offenders and introducing electronic monitoring in relation to to sopos and and sexual harm prevention orders and i do think these are this is now an, another viable technique to be considered, but it can't be done in isolation. It has to be done with other measures of control that the SOPOs and the harm prevention orders have at their disposal. So it's one additional tool within the, uh, the tactic that we can consider. Okay. Right. I, I understand the concerns of, of victims of domestic abuse. Mm. Um, there's, a, there's a comfort in knowing that their accused is, is in custody, I understand that. But the electronic monitoring actually provides a greater ability to supervise people in the community. There can be exclusion zones set mm -hmm. up, and so it can be a way of protecting um, uh, a victim of, of domestic abuse, obviously for a time limit only, it wouldn't go on forever. Um, and by someone remaining in the community. Maybe if they have a job, they can carry on working, they can still see their children and so on. So, so that it, it can be tailored to uh, support the individual circumstances of, of each case, I think. So there are positives to it then? I think so. Yeah. Any other comments? Um, that, as that's more about a policy, I don't think yeah. ICTS would have any comment to make on that question. Mr. Flynn? No. no. I agree. OK, thank you. Can I just ask, um, Mr. McCune, do you think, in terms of domestic abuse um, victims, do you think that the police have uh, are going to have a, a role to respond immediately um, in, in, in cases of breaches? And you know, would that put a, a strain on your staff resources? It may do. I, I actually think that's. I think that's the vital element to the electronic monitoring is there is no, unless I am unsighted, there is no real-time ability as it stands to, to report that breach there and then, which arguably to me is the most important aspect of it, because if somebody is breaching their curfew or their DTTO or a geographic boundary, if you like, then the question for me is why are they doing that at that time? And, we should be getting alerted, or somebody should be immediately alerted, and there should be some proactive uh, response to that. 
to try and trace that individual and understand why he or she has, has breached it. And my knowledge of this is currently that does not happen, but I'm not sure about in the future if that's part of the the, uh, the technology. But it should be. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Finney. Oh, right. um, <laughs> very good. Well, um, I wasn't expecting you to come to me, but um, can I follow up on that particular issue, uh, Mr McEwen, because it would seem to me that on that issue of, of domestic abuse, that an important factor, as always, would be the risk assessment. Is it your understanding that Police Scotland would be involved in any risk assessment associated with the decision taken to allow someone to be the subject of electronic monitoring? Because it would seem, if they are, there's a potential to say, well, given the circumstances of the conviction and past conduct, this might be inappropriate, particularly in domestic abuse cases. I, I would not anticipate that we would be part of the risk assessment Sorry, I don't anticipate, you know, so my understanding of how this works is somebody goes to court and they are convicted of an offence and or if, if bail is introduced, but we, we report the circumstances to Crown and to the courts and then it would be for the, for the sheriff, etc., to make that decision around the risk assessment and, the, and then the prisons, whether it be other aspects around the, the home curfew, around whether it is legitimate and proportionate and right to to impose the electronic monitoring. We are at the, the far end of that in the response. So can I clarify, because there would be a role for criminal justice social work around that decision that Absolutely. would inform the court. Is there liaison at that point, perhaps? I appreciate it's not maybe your area of, of work at the moment, but do you understand there to be liaison between criminal justice social work and the police service? Uh, at, I mean, at we, that point, perhaps there'll be there'll be criminal justice social work reports, and we submit a police report, and then Crown and the courts and the sheriff would, I guess, you know, assimilate all that, comprehend it, and then make their decision. And and can I ask uh, further than uh, about uh, compliance and enforcement? Is is the is it envisaged, uh, perhaps for yourself, Miss Ingalls, that this is or Mr. Flynn did that? Uh, uh, what categories would be exempt from consideration from this? If someone had previously breached court undertakings, would that by default mean they were unsuitable for this? Um, I'm not entirely sure of the answer to that question. Um, I, yeah, I, I, but I could write to the committee about that. I'm not... I'm okay. not Mr sure Flynn, would you have a view on that? I suspect it's a matter for the decision of the individual judge. Having regard to what, Mr. <coughs> a number of factors I want to take into account. Um, the seriousness of any breach would be an obvious one. Whether it was a repeated breach would be an obvious one. The advantages, nevertheless, of continuing with whatever regime that was trying to help this guy. So, but it's, it's a, it feels like a judge-led decision. Okay. Thank you very much, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart. Uh, uh, thank you. We've uh, covered quite a lot on electronic monitoring, and in the and the first 16 uh, sections of the bill cover the subject. But the one thing it doesn't cover is the use of electronic monitoring for people who are on bail, who are going to be on remand. Should it? Yes, is is, is my view. Uh, I was. Um disappointed that it wasn't more about um, use for people uh, on remand awaiting trial, and I think there is scope and benefit for extending it to include people who would be uh, otherwise uh, in custody on remand. Um, perhaps, uh, Chief Superintendent, um, it strikes me looking at the bill in the 16 sections there are, that the section on infringements that applies to offenders might have to be cast rather differently for people who are on bail. Is that a reasonable proposition that I put forward in saying that? You would have to expand a wee bit more. Well, I, mean, well I don't have an idea, is really what it boils down to. Um, because clearly the infringements bit, for example, if someone's on parole, talks about recall. And clearly, if someone's on bail, you can't talk in terms of recall because they've not been convicted of any offence at this stage. So clearly, the constructs around infringements would need to be different. 
Um, and I just wondered if there was a view in the panel. It, it may be there isn't a view, and it may be that others, in particular perhaps the government minister in due course, has to be asked that question rather than mm -hmm. yourselves. And if that's the case, we can move rapidly on. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, one, the element that's missing from me currently is about the power of arrest, and it's back to that sort of proactive response so that the police don't have a power of arrest should any individual breach in real time their curfews. You know, if we come across an individual that has breached a curfew we, and we are aware they've breached the curfew, we cannot arrest that individual at that time at 3 o'clock in the morning. We have no power arrest to do that. The, the report then has to be submitted to the respective sheriff who then issues a warrant so that individual is left to go on their way. So I think the power of arrest is something that should be considered. So this, this looks like you're talking about section 13. Uh, subsection 3, no offence is committed by reason of breaching the disposal, and then it refers back to uh, subsection 1, uh, which is basically describing it. So the, the, even in relation to offenders, there is a gap in what's in front of us in the bill um, that would equally apply in the case of bail. Yes. Yes, right. I don't think I have any more to say on that subject. Thank you. Just very briefly, um, supplementary from Liam MacArthur. Yeah, is the is this issue not more fundamental in that the name of the bill is about the management of offenders bill and therefore it would not be competent to deal with electronic monitoring of those on bail as they are not deemed to be offenders. That was certainly the view we had from some of our witnesses um, in an earlier evidence session. I see Mr oh, Flynn nodding his well, head. I would just say that sounds like a, a kind of technical legal uh, These technical legal that, issues that tend that to get in the way, I've I, I, I found. <laughs> would that be the, the view of SCTS? Um, I suppose it, we, we would simply be making the point that, yes, it, this is about the terminology used and, and the word offender. Um, I think that because some of the orders to which uh, uh, electronic monitoring can be added are actually civil in nature as well, um, such as the SOPO and the, the sexual harm prevention order, um, that that is something that the government will have to look at. Also, if regulations are made by ministers to extend the availability of electronic monitoring to pre-trial situations, um, then yes, it would not be appropriate to refer to the, the individual as an offender. Right. At that point, they are not an offender. So, so it, is, it, it seems that it is an issue that will have to be considered. And would it be the view of the tribunal, court's tribunal service that, that, that it wouldn't be competent in the context of a bill that is entitled the Management of Offenders Bill? I, I don't have a view on the, co the competence or otherwise. I think we are simply making the point that um, the wording perhaps needs to be looked at. Right. Sorry, I cut across you, Mr. Well, well, I was going to say, I mean, I know others, uh, I saw the written submissions uh, to the committee and others were saying that offender was an unhelpful word and mm -hmm. just suggesting that there should be a different title. I don't know how easy or difficult it is to change the, the title of a, of, of a bill, but I mean, if that's a consequence of including bail, then uh, so be it. That would need to be done. Okay. Briefly, Liam Kerr. Briefly, um, can I just put a question to the SCTS? Uh, you, in your evidence before the committee, you talked about a 2005-06 pilot scheme involving uh, electronic monitoring as a condition of bail, and I think the Scottish Government concluded that it was not helpful. Uh, are you able just to share any more details on that? Why was it not helpful? What went wrong, if I can put it that way? Um, in terms of the pilot scheme, which happened in 2005-06, um, I understand it was carried out in about four courts throughout Scotland and that on the back of the pilots there was uh, a kind of evaluation report and my very general understanding of that is that whilst um, it seemed to work there were limitations to it and indeed those limitations were referred to when um, the provisions were then the provisions which enabled a pilot to take place were actually repealed um, by the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act. And those um, points were made that it was um, not used very often and that it had a, a high cost attached to it and that also it placed a, a huge burden on enforcement agencies. And I think our evidence was simply making the point that 
as these types of pilot were run a decade ago mm -hmm. and on the face of it looks like they were deemed not to have worked, we, we made the point that we just were, were struggling to understand the rationale for now, for now doing it. We were simply made, making the point without any kind of judgment on it. No, it's useful. It is, the, the committee will need to be cognisant of that going forward in, in some form. So, thank you, Convener. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, it's just to make the observation, the short title can be amended by an amendment to section 50, uh, which is the short title, m m the difficulty lies with a long title, I think, because the long title attempts to capture the, the uh, general principles of the bill, and the presiding officer is often quite reluctant to allow that to be tampered with significantly, but it has happened. Okay, thank you. Can we move on now to disclosure of convictions? And um, the first question, I think, from Liam. Back to you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, yes, yeah, so moving on to disclosure of convictions, just as a general principle, the, the policy memorandum makes clear that the aim of the bill is to balance uh, the right of a, a, an offender not to have to disclose uh, a previous criminal past against the protection of the public. So do any of the witnesses have any views on whether the bill as drafted achieves that balance? Mr. Strang. Um, I'm not sure that I see it as, as balancing two different, different needs, as if what was good for the person who was convicted and for the victim are, are necessarily opposed, because I think it's good for everybody if rehabilitation works. So someone who has been offended, been convicted, if they manage to, um, if you want to use that well, term I use about be rehabilitated and then um, live a constructive life that doesn't include committing offences, then that's in the interest of potential future victims who are no longer victims. It's in the interest of the previous victim if, if this person doesn't re-offend. So, I um, welcome a provision in that I think it makes it helpful for people to change the course of their life, to, to get a job, to be rehabilitated. And so I don't see that it's, you know, by somehow giving an advantage to the offender, you're, you're diminishing the, the rights and benefits to the victim. So I think it, it's um, where it works and someone gets a job and makes a, 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 con a constructive future for their life, then uh, that's of benefit to them, to potential victims, previous victims, and to society as a whole. Thank you. Does anyone else have a comment on that? In which case, I'll, I'll bring you back, Mr. Strang, if I may. The, we heard last week, or this committee heard last week, about the uh, predictive value of convictions and almost a, a diminishing predictive value over time. So, do you get a sense or are you comfortable that the disclosure periods proposed uh, take sufficient account of the predictive value of convictions? But the proposals only affect short sentences so longer sentences aren't affected and um, you're right that, that a previous conviction is not a good um, predictor of, of future behaviour, and particularly after time has gone, I think in a submission to your committee, it talks about seven to ten years, That's that right. someone who hasn't been convicted of an offence for seven to ten years is no more likely, I mean these are, these are broad statistics rather than individual cases, but is no more likely to offend than someone who has no previous conviction. So it's, it's an inexact science, and of course the, the problem with your question is you're extrapolating from you know, individual cases to, to the broad population. So you can talk about you know, percentage chance of reconviction for a population, but that doesn't mean for that individual that they are 50% likely to reoffend or not. So you have to look at each individual um, case uh, on its merits. But I think, to but answer your question, I think, I'm, I think it is um, satisfactory that the changes that are proposed. Do you not then... I doesn't that highlight one of the problems with using, a, if you like, a blanket disclosure period uh, to say this is an appropriate disclosure period when, as you've rightly pointed out, uh, individuals behave in individual ways? Uh, is a blanket disclosure period the right method then or is there something else? 
Well, I, I mean, I think you need to have, have consistent uh, rules. I, I don't think I, think... I think the principle is helpful that people can put their past behind them and make a fresh start. And I think it's... You know, you have to arbitrarily draw the line somewhere. I think for less serious offences, which are reflected in less serious sentences, that it makes sense that the disclosure period is is less than for a long sentence for a serious crime. So, uh, no, I, I wouldn't criticise the principle of um, ha having uh, a disclosure period. And would you then, if, if we start from a place that says the uh, disclosure period is based on sentence alone, uh, which I accept your point that the offence creates the sentence, creates a disclosure period, but should the disclosure period be based on more than just sentence then? Uh, uh, explicitly more than just sentence? For example, the, the severity of the offence? Or... Well, then it becomes a different... It's, it's a different issue than disclosure of conviction. Um, so, I mean, there are, you know, there are other ways in which people with particular offences are banned from working with vulnerable children and so on. So that... I think you're asking a different question from, from what's proposed in, in the bill. And I think what's in the bill, in my view, is, is a, a step in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, Morris. Um, do you feel that the um, bill does enough in terms of changing attitudes to the employment of people with convictions? Um, and, and do you believe there's, that what, something more may, might be done separately from the bill, i.e. in terms of changing recruitment practices by companies and employers? Right. Well, shall I? You start from the right. <laughs> what, a, what a huge question. Yes, I'd like you to legislate to remove the stigma that people have yeah. against people who've been in prison. No, I, I mean, you're absolutely right that, of course, people's attitudes are much more important. Mm. And it's interesting that people leaving prison who are successful in getting jobs are often employed by either a previous employer who knows them and know that they were a decent worker, have, have offended, gone to prison, and they welcome them back, or else they're employed by a brother or an uncle or, or a cousin. So, um, you know, it is a, it, it, it is, it's an unintended but very real barrier to rehabilitation, the fact that someone has a criminal conviction and a prison sentence behind them, mm -hmm. um, you know, irrespective of disclosure issues. And, and I think it's perfectly understandable. If you're an employer and you've got two people that are suitable, it's a natural instinct to say, I'll take the one who's not been in prison because they're likely to be a better worker and more honest and et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's, there's a lot of, you know, the, your question is absolutely right. There's lots of uh, judgmental attitudes, there's stigma mm -hmm. associated. And that's why it is so difficult for people to get out of a life of crime, mm -hmm. particularly short sentences going round and round the system because um, it's really hard to, to get a job um, unless, as I say, you've got, got someone who can give you that leg up in, into employment. That's the experience of a lot of people in prison. Right. Would you say that people like Sir John Timpson and um, Greggs and Virgin, for example, trains, have actually managed to cross that barrier and employing, and taking people on very successfully, in fact? Would you, that's an example that obviously we can quote. Um, yes, yes, they have. I think it's more down south than, than in Scotland, mm -hmm. particularly. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, those are good examples where um, they have set, um, you know, set, set a really, uh, almost a moral lead and say, well, no, we will give um, people who have right. served a prison sentence a, a second chance. Mr. McEwen, do you any? I don't have any views on, on that latter point. The, the, the crux of it, from, from my perspective, is the rules of the disclosure need to be clear. Because, you know, any incidents that I've been involved in over the years where people have, have failed to disclose convictions when they should have been, a lot of the time it's because of a misunderstanding of what the rules for disclosure are. So I think they need to be crystal clear for everybody to, to abide by them. And, and really that's, that's the crux of it. And I do agree with the principle that if somebody is convicted of a more serious offence, there should be a longer time before these convictions become unspent. And I think those for a less serious offence, then it should be a, a shorter time frame. So I agree with the principles behind that. Right. Ms. Ingles, do you have any? Um, no, SCTS, um, our written evidence only covered part one of the bill. We don't have any right. comments okay. to make no, on part two. Right, okay, thank you. Um, Supplementary? <clears throat> I just wanted to come back on what the Chief Superintendent has said. And looking at the bill, uh, particularly at Section 5, but not only at Section 5, um, it, it, 
the same phrase is used in two different places. Um, when a requirement with license conditions is the heading, and it says at subsection 5, the Scottish ministers must explain to the offender the purpose mentioned in subsection, in other words, what the conditions are, and warn the offender of the consequence of failing to fulfil the object, uh, obligations. And I just wonder, having over the, this is my 265th Justice Committee meeting, uh, that, uh, that, that whether part of the problem is that people in a confusing situation that's novel to them, whether they actually absorb and understand what they are being told, and whether there should also be an obligation to check that what is being said is understood. Because it strikes me that quite a lot of people will find it very challenging to understand really what it means for them. Is, is that a fair observation on my part, based on your experience of dealing with uh, uh, offenders who are in breach? It, is there genuine scope for imagining there's confusion that we might do a little bit more about at the point conditions are put in place? I, I think so. I mean, my experience of this is many, many years ago as you know, part of sort of Disclosure Scotland. And what I found was that people that failed to disclose the right information at times, and you know, if we picked up on them, it was through a lack of understanding. Some, some may have done it intentionally, but it was uh, a confusion and lack of understanding. And you know, some of these individuals struggle to understand some of the requirements that are placed upon them, and any help that we could provide them to do so, I think, would be advantageous. Thank you. I think we're staying with you for the next question. In, indeed, indeed, we are. Uh, ben, we might sorry, be beg your pardon. Yes. Th thank you, Convener. Just, just, just a small question that's not been fully covered in, in answers on this point. Uh, Mr McEwen, I note in your uh, submission you said many people who committed crimes in their youth never re-offend, and I think that's a really important point. And one of the aspects that the Bill is currently drafted uh, seeks to address. Do, do you feel that it addresses... Uh, pe people c committing uh, crimes in their youth being able to, to move on effectively as, as the drafting is currently, or is there anything that could enhance that in your view? Uh, so, so I do think that you know people, you know people can offend at any time during their their lifespan, but and they might only offend once and never reoffend again. So, you know, for me, the principle of the the bill is to, rather than remand these individuals, is to, to look at other ways to, to manage them so they perhaps don't lose their job, they perhaps do still get to see their kids, they perhaps don't lose their house. So it's to try and balance the needs of the victim and the risk to the victim whilst giving some offenders that are committing the maybe the isolated offence or the lower level offence a second chance prior to remanding them. Thank you. Okay, Stuart. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Friday is the, the day when the general data protection uh, regulations come into force. Um, but my question kind of relates to the status quo as well as uh, what changes might be made in that uh, Disclosure Scotland might not reveal that there's a spent conviction, but a perusal of the newspaper's archives would be quite readily in many cases uh, do so. Have you any views to whether the GDPR creates a general right to be forgotten in relation to uh, published uh, information, or is that something that's beyond the scope of the, the panel's understanding? Beyond my scope, I wouldn't attempt right. to answer that one. Right. Yeah, no, I, don't have you, I don't have views on, on that no. subject. I, I kind of suspected that. <laughs> <laughs> Just a very final brief question from me. It's about the higher level disclosure checks. Um, the bill doesn't make any changes to those. I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Are you in agreement with that? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Those are likely to be people who are higher risk and therefore I think that that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other views? No? Okay. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of this session. Um, that was very useful. Thanks very much indeed. Um, we'll have a brief um, comfort break now to allow the witnesses to leave and for our second panel to take their places.
resume um, the meeting, please, and welcome our second panel, um, who is John Watt, Chair, and Colin Spivey, Chief Executive of the Parole Board for Scotland. <coughs> and can I thank the Parole Board for your written evidence? It was, it was very useful. So can we move straight to questions, please? Um, Mary, first question. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to have you in front of us today because I think we've had some questions about the parole board, so it's good to have some representatives here uh, to answer some of those. And it was really just to start off by getting, if you could tell us a bit about how the parole board operates at present and what the changes that are proposed in the bill uh, will mean. How the parole board operates at the moment? Um, <laughs> I know, just, a, just an easy one to start off. <laughs> Essentially... <clears throat> or even just in the context of the right. changes that are proposed the, in terms of the, the bill. The board at the minute operates in terms of the uh, 1993 Act, um, which, is, which lacks detail about what the board ought to do, how it should do it, in relation to some of the tests, what they should be, uh, and nothing in relation to governance. Now, we've had to pretty much invent a governance system, which is not ideal, and we rely on a lot of case law, mostly English, in relation to tests to be applied for some releases uh, and just how those tests, what those tests actually mean. So, a lot of clarity is absent from the current legislation. What we hope the new legislation will give us is reinforcement of independence. The War Boys case, um, went into that in some detail. Other cases have also. The board's a court, and it needs that independence, and it needs to be reinforced, in my view. Uh, I think the public and prisoners need to understand what tests are to be applied uh, in relation to each type of release so that they understand what's happening. The public ought to, uh, more widely. The media certainly should. And in relation to some coverage, it's apparent there are wide misunderstandings. Um, the, the membership prescriptions are at present unhelpful because they create all sorts of difficulties for us. Now, I dare say there'll be some questions about that reading the, the previous transcripts, so I'll maybe leave that to one side for the moment. Um, but wh what the, the new provisions will give us is, is more certainty, better understanding of the reflection of what we do, because much of this... Uh, the changes reflect what we actually do uh, and of key importance for us is that it will reinforce our position as a court. Uh, that's widely misunderstood. The authorities say it clearly enough, but the public out there don't read case reports. We are a court and, and need to be treated as a court and I think these changes will bring us a long way towards that. Thank you very much. And I, I do agree with what you've said about public understanding because sometimes I think that's the benefit of doing sessions like this and doing the scrutiny that we do is that we actually get to hear a bit more about the general workings of the parole board itself and again what the changes, the proposed changes will mean. I, you talked a bit about there about the, the governance and how you've really just had to arrange that yourselves and mm -hmm. that was a bit that I'd highlighted in your evidence too um, where you suggest that the bill should set out arrangements for governance through uh, a management board which would be distinct to the parole board so I'd just be interested to hear I mean is that currently the way it operates at present and you would just like to see that outlined the, in yes the, the way it works at the moment is that the name parole board has caused all sorts of problems in the past the board's been treated like a management board not deliberately but I think just through inattention or lack of understanding so the word board in the title creates problems we have what we call a management group I didn't want to call it a board because then we'd have a board of a board and it becomes unduly complicated. Uh, we don't have non-exec members yet. Um, th the way this works is that uh, in the past, all the membership, and there were 30-odd at the time, constituted the membership, the, the, the management board, which is clearly unworkable. Uh, and we consulted with our legal advisors and came up with a model which um, set up a parole board management group which is the, the, um, essentially a management board, uh, and made it clear in a new memorandum, a memorandum of understanding with Scottish ministers that this is what we would do and that members at large would have no management functions. They would have purely judicial functions. Uh, and that's essentially how we did it. We took what we thought was best practice and set up the best that we could. I anticipate that in future, 
it would simply be formalised as a management group uh, with um, a requirement for some non-execs from outside the, the board. But you would like to see that laid out in the... I, I would like to see it set out in statute um, along with appropriate wording about the board's independence um, so that we have the independence and we have a way of governing that independent status. You can't have one without the other, I don't think. Yeah. And so the evidence that we received um, from the Sheriff's Association, they had uh, noted a concern that, uh, that the bill doesn't propose to reconstitute the parole board for Scotland as a statutory tribunal uh, within the ambit of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. I just wonder what your views on that were and if that was something that you would have preferred to have seen. Um, I don't necessarily prefer to see it. And I think it was the senator rather than the sheriffs who said that. Was it not the response from the senators of the College of Justice? I, well, th this is from the Sheriff's Association. Okay. That's whoever, whoever it was, um, this was um, discussed, I suppose, 2013-14, when the tribunals were being restructured. Uh, and at that time, I rather thought we would be absorbed into the Scottish Courts Tribunal Service. But it was made very clear very early on that wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to happen... I think primarily because the SCTS didn't have the capacity to take on any more tribunals and that the parole board was so far down the list that nothing would happen in the foreseeable future. Now, my understanding at that time was that there were also concerns about compatibility, that there were some in SCTS who were concerned that the body, the judicial body which decided on release from prison would be in the same organisation as judicial bodies who put those prisoners in there in the first place. Uh, so I, I wasn't quite sure what the reason was, but on the basis that it was so far into the distance, it was unlikely to be my problem. I just put it to one side. It has changed since then. We, we thought maybe towards the end of last year, I think it was, that door might be opening slightly. Uh, so I think Scottish so Government had some discussions with SCTS and the Lord President's office, but it was made clear that that wasn't going to happen. I don't know what the position is just now. As far as we're concerned, it's, it's not on the horizon, so it's not a realistic prospect. And to that extent, I've put it to one side. In principle, I can't really see a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in practice, though, I think we'd have to understand a lot more about the circumstances in which we absorb, how the absorption would take place, what would it mean for the board, uh, and... I really haven't applied my mind to that. So I think the answer is, in principle, I, I see some merit in that proposal, but it doesn't seem to be a realistic prospect at the moment. Okay, um, and I just have one final question. It was just in terms of some of the evidence that we heard in previous mm -hmm. evidence sessions, and it was really to get your view on imposing a six-month time limit on a prisoner making representations about recall from release on a home detention curfew. Mm -hmm. So I think we'd heard in previous evidence concern about that six-month limit being in place. But I suppose it was just really to get an idea from yourselves. If, I mean, do you foresee that being an issue if that is imposed? I mean, is that something that prisoners on recall tend to do? quite it's, a lot anyway, um, or does it no, take quite no, a long time um, for them to get around to do it's not, it's not really an issue. And I, I think, if I may say from reading some of the previous transcripts, there's a misunderstanding about home detention curfew. Home detention curfew can only happen after the parole board has made a decision that uh, a prisoner can be released on parole licence, a determinate prisoner can be released on parole licence. So that decision may take place say, eight or ten weeks before the actual parole qualifying date. Now, in the period between the decision and the parole qualifying date, SPS can release a prisoner at home detention curfew. Now, that will end on the parole qualifying date because he'll be out on parole by that time or she. So it's only in that window that HDC operates. Now, really, you could almost close the window at the parole qualifying date because it isn't relevant anymore. Okay. The six-month um, limit was a bit of a compromise, I think, um, I might have argued for a shorter period, but six months is kind of academic by that time. The, the reason for all of this originally, as I understand it, was that SPS rules prevented anybody who'd been recalled from an HDC getting HDC in the future, any time in the future. So an HDC recalled in this sentence would count against a prisoner in a sentence imposed three, four, five, six years down the line. 
Uh, so they'd be refused HDC then, and the only way they can deal with that was to seek to appeal the original decision to recall them on HDC. And we've got some figures that, that show that these appeals were taken uh, up to nine years after the event. And that was only because they hadn't appealed at the time, not understanding the consequences. That rule's gone now, as I understand it. So it's no longer really significant. Six months, in my view, creates no problem given the current position. May even be too generous. Okay, thank you very much for clarifying okay, that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we've also heard that um, in evidence that there should be a single test for decisions on the release of prisoners. Mm -hmm. What's your view on that? Um, our view has varied over time. We found it difficult to formulate a single test. There should be tests. Can I say, first of all, departing from the question slightly, every release ought to have a test to be applied to it, a statutory test, and not every release does have a statutory test. Now, we've thought about this and taken some legal advice, and we consider that there is a, statutory te a single test which may be applied and that is the test which presently applies for life cases. The parole board will not give a direction for release unless it is satisfied that it is no longer necessary for the protection of the public that the prisoner should be confined. That sets out in a single test what we have to look at, protection of the public against the interests of the prisoner not to be confined. So we think that a single test would be best, would be useful, that failing uh, and that would be the single test we would propose. That failing, there should be a test for each release. Okay, thank you. Daniel, supplementary? Actually, I'd like, I'd like to follow up on two points that you've raised. First of all, can I just ask about the point of independence? And I think it's, it's an interesting point. Is that, to your mind, uh, uh, important because uh, as a matter of principle? Is it one of status or is it one of, sort of safeguarding against some future administration or some combination? Could you just sort of explain a little bit more? It's why a matter it's so of important? principle. If we accept that the board is a court, then it has to be able to demonstrate its independence. It's not so much that it's independent. I don't think anybody thinks the board is not independent. It's the appearance of independence. The public out there have to have confidence uh, that the board is independent from what it sees and what it knows and if it doesn't see or read or know what provisions are in place for that independence, there is at least a risk uh, that we don't have the appearance of independence. It's some individuals, uh, yeah. So I think some responses mentioned that appearance of independence, if I remember correctly. Uh, and it's certainly reinforced in War Boys. So it's really only stating for posterity the position uh, as it is at the minute as it ought to be recorded for the future. So a matter of principle and protection, uh, I think. That would be, if that answers your question. It, it does. No, thank you very much. That's, that's useful. I would also like to ask you about the, the, the test and go into that in a, a little bit more detail. And I think you, both in your written su submission and you've just raised there, the, the, the case of war boys. And I think, mm. to my mind, uh, the, the, the reason that was so controversial, the reason there was a, an, an outcry, is because fundamentally, I think the public didn't understand why or how that decision was made. And I think that a test would, would help. Now, you've laid out one parameter of test. I, I, can I ask you if you think that is sufficient? Just because I think there were other parameters that I think the public would probably expect to see. So, yes, public safety is one, but there's also, I think, the risk of, of reoffending. Uh, and could I also suggest also that, that whether or not the individual has actually reformed and is remorseful for the crime. Are, are there these elements that could the, be added to, no. to such a well, test? I, you wouldn't add that to a test because it would then become completely unmanageable, I think. These are factors taken into account by the board in making a decision, of course. Uh, and that test, which, which I read out, has been examined by courts over the years and has been expanded and been explained. Uh, so the sort of things that the board would take into account would be previous offending, would be conduct in prison, would be um, recommendations from social workers, would be the extent to which the offender is addressed as offending behaviour through programmes. Uh, the, these are all issues that would be taken into account by the board, and I see no reason why that ought not to be published somewhere uh, as, as part of the board's bread and butter work but not necessarily in the test. These would be how the test would be applied. For example, uh, 
no longer necessary protection of the public. And you may ask, well, from what? And it's the protection uh, of the public from the risk of harm. Uh, and then you may say, well, how do you define risk and how do you define harm? And the courts have done this over the years. Uh, so <coughs> risk is loosely defined yeah. as, as contingent possibility. Uh, protection is pre protection from harm. Now, the courts have been notoriously slow to define what that means, but it's generally accepted it has to be risk of, of harm, physical harm, sexual offending. We think in, in a, in a, if the case merited it, you could move into things like psychological harm. It's a philosophical discussion you could have pretty much all day, but these are factors to be taken into account in applying the test. Now, if the board didn't take sufficient factors into account, for example, in War Boys, where War Boys, um, the dossier omitted certain key documents, uh, and the board failed to take account of the importance of outstanding charges, uh, then the court can intervene and say you must take that decision again because you were wrong when you declined to take account of outstanding charges. Now the Board in Scotland does, does that as part of our guidance that nothing is, is unavailable as evidence. Everything bearing on risk can be considered. The only question is what weight you apply to it. So the answer to the question is it should appear somewhere. The public should know about it. Uh, and I think possibly uh, it should appear it could go on the board's website, for example. We're in the, in the course of revising all our guidance, uh, and that will be published on the website in due course, and that kind of thing will be in there. Uh, but I think that's a very interesting suggestion. Would you like to see that as a, a, a requirement, perhaps, in, in this bill, that, that the board publishes its, the factors and how it applies them, even if it's a, a, for, in an illustrative way uh, rather than a kind of a prescriptive manner? I, we're going to do it, so... Yeah. I don't really mind one way or the other. <clears throat> but I, I think it would be better if, if it was perhaps in the rules, maybe, rather than primary yeah. legislation. So, so you, you're saying that the, 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 the factors might be a sub subject to secondary legislation? Well, the factors would not be, because you can't legislate what factors the board will take into account. Okay. Every case is different. There's a whole range of factors. I think all I can say is that there is no factor which would be omitted in advance. We can't say in advance what we will or will not consider. Mm -hmm. So it would be difficult to express it. My preference would be to leave it to the board to publish. And then if there was a... If, if Scottish Government or, or Parliament thought there was a pressing need for more detail to be in the public domain, then... Um, legislate at that point, possibly. I mean, there are a whole dose of issues around transparency and allowing people in to see proceedings in process. Mm -hmm. And that's probably a better way of allowing the public to understand what it is that we do and how we do it. In, in, indeed, the, in a previous evidence session, Douglas Thompson, who I believe is a previous member of yes. the, the, the board, uh, made the suggestion that, that, that minutes, albeit in a redacted form, uh, could be and perhaps should be published mm -hmm. as a, a means of achieving that transparency. Do you think that's a suggestion that... that oh, yes. We were thinking about this uh, along with how we can involve victims more prior to War Boys and had got to a point where we are now revising our decision minutes so they can be more easily redacted mm -hmm. with a view to publishing them on the website. Now, I think uh, Douglas Thompson said two things in quick succession. One was public hearings and then redacted minutes, but mm -hmm. obviously you can't have both. Uh, so redacted minutes, absolutely, I have no problem with that at all. I think it would be a good thing, and we're partway down that line already. And, and just finally, um, you, you, you're making the suggestion that there should be some sort of test uh, on the face of the bill, albeit perhaps um, uh, provided for in detail by secondary legislation. Do you think there's sufficient um, evidence in terms of the consultation that the, the Scottish Government undertook in order to formulate such a test? Because obviously it would require kind of demonstration that there's public support for the there test. There has to be a formulation of a test. Now the courts have hesitated to define the test too closely. And I would counsel against defining the test too closely, either in primary or secondary legislation. I think what I was suggesting was that it should be left to the board to, to publish its guidance and then the courts somewhere down the line would say in that particular case your guidance was wrong or it wasn't applied properly or you omitted some consideration for the test. 
uh, if the, the courts have been slow to, to try and define the test more closely, and they have been, and it needs to be open to deal with a wide range of circumstances that the board deals with, I, I would hesitate very much at defining it more closely and leave it to the courts to evolve the test, which they have done already. So we have an evolution of the test, mostly in England and Wales, but applies in Scotland also. I think the, it should be a simple test left to the courts to interpret. Um, yeah, just to add to, add to that in terms of the consultation um, that, that did take place on parole reform last year, although that didn't go into the detail of what the test may be, there was uh, an overwhelming response in favour of there being um, uh, clear tests and, and, and possibly a single test as well. So th there is an appetite out there for, for this to be done. We have tests, sorry, we have tests which we apply at the moment derived from cases north and south of the border. So for a determinate prisoner, our working test is whether that person's risk can be safely managed in the community. And if they were separate tests, that could be adapted quite simply because we've been doing it for decades, I suppose, mm -hmm. having developed it over those decades and the courts up until now have been happy enough with it. Nobody's quibbled it. But I don't think it's, it's good to have a court-derived test like that. Well, it, it's possible to set it out clearly, even though it's based on that kind of development of the law in a piece of legislation. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary, Stuart Stevenson. Um, I was just going to pick up because uh, Daniel brought up the subject of independence and developed that a little if I may con convene it. Um, in the evident, written evidence that you provided to the committee at section 14, uh, you draw our attention to section 3 of the Tribunal Scotland Act 2014, um, which I must say I'm grateful for you bringing to my attention because it places a duty on me and the rest of us. Uh, it, it, the following persons must uphold the independence of members of the Scottish tribunals, and uh, D is members of the Scottish Parliament. In other words, we actually have a legal duty. Now, I don't know if I have to uphold it by some positive action every single day, or whether it really means I must avoid doing something that would be in conflict with upholding it. I'm not certain about that. Um, but we've talked about the courts evolving the test mm -hmm. in the discussion we've just been having. If we're, we were, as you are recommending to us, uh, to adopt uh, for, 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 for the parole board, uh, section three of tribunals, etc., cetera, um, one of the people on there is the Lord Advocate who's responsible for the court system. So wouldn't, if the courts are then evolving the, the tests that you apply, is that not in turn? Am, am I just being too, I devious you're being, here. You're, you're being too devious, and if I may, the Lord Advocate is not responsible for the court system. Uh, that's true, of course. It's He's the Lord responsible President. responsible for the public prosecution. The Lord President yes, correct. Uh, has to... The First Minister... Um, Scottish Parliament. I suppose the Lord President has to be free to interfere, isn't he? <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, I think. It's, it's but, had... I think it's, it's perhaps too devious. What, what it really means is that no one should take any steps to undermine the independence or appearance of independence. That it, would be where I would go. But isn't it quite unusual to actually legislate a specific... Anybody else who... The implication immediately becomes when you create a list that anyone who's not on the list can um, interfere with your independence to your heart's content. For example, uh, the police service are not on the list. Well, the police can't interfere because they've got no authority to interfere. No, I, now, I'm, I'm, I'm just really... So it, it really is designed to deal, I think, with those who might be in a position to take steps in their official capacities to undermine the appearance of independence of the parole board. And you could well see how politicians would be in that position, for uh, example, especially in Parliament. Yes, although it goes on in the, the, the second subsection of Section 3 um, to uh, the, 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 the First Minister, Lord Advocate, Scottish Ministers must not seek to influence particular decisions. But I, as a humble backbencher, can do so to my heart's content. And I'm not quite I, sure you, you why could, the distinction's made. As, as the chair of the board, I, I could have regard to what you say, but perhaps place little weight on it. And let's face it, if you've got something to say, and it bears on risk, uh, then happy to take into account in a judicial capacity, and you're entitled to argue that the board's not working and needs wholesale restructuring and that uh, it doesn't have the appearance of independence as a backbencher. Uh, of course you're free, that's democracy, of course you're free to say that. Uh, 
convener. I think I've exhausted that one. Okay, thank you. Liam MacArthur, supplementary. Following that up um, a bit, I mean, obviously you've said uh, in your written submission that you don't think the bill necessarily goes far enough in, in um, uh, underscoring that perception of independence <coughs> rather than the, the, the practice of independence. I mean, where in the bill could we, um, as a committee perhaps, go further um, in, in delivering that outcome? That's more about draftsmanship and principle, isn't it? I think well, I, I would mean, leave I, that to the I'm parliamentary sure we've draftsman. Got very, we've got very clever people that help with the, the, the craftsmanship stuff um, here. But we might have to come back to you on that one. That, that's not I, something I'd thought about. Well, that, I mean, that would that would be okay, independence and governance. Presently, clause 44 talks about the continued independence of action. It's called. I'm not entirely sure what that means continued independence would have been fine. I imagine, what it says here uh, under clause 44.1, the parole boards to continue to act as an independent tribunal when exercising decision-making functions. Uh, that wouldn't be in there. Don't know. I'd have to come back to you on that, but That'd with some mature thought on it. Yeah. Is that all right, convener? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Uh, so I'm interested in understanding the parole board a little Mm -hmm. better, uh, because I don't. Uh, so I'm just going to fire some questions, if you don't mind, just on procedure and things like that. Uh, my understanding from reading the evidence is that the parole board, or it's a tribunal, in effect, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's a, yes, a tribunal. It's a uh, non-departmental tribunal body, isn't it? Right? Yeah. yeah, tribunal NDPB. Okay. So there are two to three people who will make a decision. So uh, those two to three are selected from... 30-odd. There are 40-odd now. There are now 40. Mm -hmm. uh, so how are those two to three selected? How many times does the parole board sit, and how many times does any given individual sit in any given year? Now, that, the number of days members sit varies on the availability they can give, subject mm -hmm. to the rule that it has to be 20 days or more. Right. Practically, what happens is that there's a scheduler who works for... Um, call on here. And roughly three months in advance, uh, she, it's a she, yes. will ask members for their availability and they will give their availability for, say, July. I've just done that. Yes. Armed with that availability and the number of cases that have to be dealt with, she will then allocate cases to groups of three uh, and that's how it works, basically. Understand. If, if there are not enough members, she will ask for more. If there are not enough cases, then some members won't get selected to, to work in that month. But members give their availability, and they're very good at that, I have to say, uh, and they do give a good spread of availability. Uh, that's how it works. I am responsible overall for that, and the, the, um, the groupings of members tend to be at random. We would never keep any members from another member. I haven't up till now. Maybe I should never say never, but... Uh, it's my responsibility, ultimately. I dev devolve that to the chief executive, who in turn devolves it to the scheduler, and it then becomes an administrative process. Mm -hmm. There are tribunals sitting roughly two, three a day, mm -hmm. some by uh, live link TV, some in prisons, each of them involving three members chaired by a legal member. Mm -hmm. On two days of the week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, there are groups of three members chaired by a legal member who deal with paper cases. There are about 2,500 cases a year and perhaps 800 or so are dealt with at tribunals face to face. The rest are dealt with on paper by groups of individuals, groups of members who sit on Tuesday and Thursday and the work is split equally between them. On Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, it gets kind of complicated. We have smaller groups of two who sit to consider cases of urgency. So for example, where a report has been received that uh, an offender in the community has breached a license condition or can no longer be safely manageable. The supervising officer will submit a report and that will go to either a two-sum on a Monday, Wednesday or Friday or a three-sum on a Tuesday or Thursday every day of the week so that we can deal with them quickly. Uh, and those cases are given a priority because they carry with them an increased level of risk to the public. So that's the kind of setup of, of how we disperse members. Uh, and the cases are just allocated. So on those Tuesdays and Thursdays, you might be lucky and have 
12 or 15 cases, you might have 20 or 25. Right. The work has to be done and members just soak it up on a swings and roundabouts basis. And what training uh, is given to the lay members? So I appreciate there's one very significantly trained legal member, uh, but the lay members, if I'm allowed to call them that. What general, training, general members. General members. <laughs> so what training is given to the general members? 22 general members. General members get uh, a two-week introductory training course, and we'll just finish that. And it covers risk assessment in detail, of course. It covers legal issues, it covers diversity, it covers practical issues like how to use your IT and things like that. Uh, and it involves in-depth discussion on tribunals and casework meetings. The, the meetings, the paper meetings are called casework meetings. So we've created, I suppose, six or eight dummy cases. Uh, and we go through these in significant detail. And while we go through them, we discuss all the key issues. There's ongoing training also, so that's two weeks of introductory training. They shadow other members uh, while tribunals and casework meetings are, are live so that they can see how that works. And then we have a training group which gathers views from members and from me as to what training might be required in the course of the year. We've got three set piece training days throughout the year on key developments. The next one's likely to be the fallout from War Boys, I would have thought. So do you have any view on whether the change, the, the, the proposals will impact on the members' ability to dispose of cases? None at all. No concerns? No concerns. No. Okay. Um, a couple of final questions, if I may. What is the reoffending rate for a paroled prisoner? I'm not sure that we've got figures for that. We had manually gathered figures uh, and we moved to an electronic system. And as you might guess, we lost some number crunching ability. It used to be something in the order of, and this is only a few years ago, 6% uh, of prisoners, I, I give this with a warning proviso, sure. something like 6% of offenders who were released on parole license, that's by decision of the board, um, were ultimately recalled because they were no longer safely manageable in the community. Uh, and predictably, something like 16% of, of those released on non-parole license, that's by operation of law, uh, were recalled. Uh, it's kind of difficult because some... Yeah, uh, one, one, one of the... Uh, uh, the difficulties with this is once somebody has gone past the end of their, their parole period, um, it's not something we would have necessarily information on in terms of their reoffending. That information will be held elsewhere in the, in the system. Sorry, I misunderstood the question. I thought you were talking about reoffending while on licence. Uh, well, that, that, that was actually the question I was going to come on to. All right, well, right. my question was reoffending while on licence, but reoffending, that, that, I think that would be a much broader issue. The Scottish Government may have some information, statistical people may have some information, but right. we tend not to, uh, if only because... It's kind of unhelpful. If you take a decision based on the facts and circumstances of an individual case, that's fine. That's what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. But looking at reoffending figures, so much can change between that decision and the reoffending that it's it's hard to link the two. I think. So the answer to your question is we don't have the statistics. I don't know who would. I'll find out. And I'm not sure they'd be helpful to the board anyway. Maybe Thank to you. you. Thank you. Supplementary, Stuart Stevenson. Um, I, I just sought uh, confirmation that you said 6% of people on parole are recalled. That was my general uh, recollection. Well, wh wh whatever the number is, the, the question which I wanted to just get confirmation, that it's perfectly possible to be recalled without an offence having been committed. Yes. Yes. Thank you. You want me to expand on that? And I, 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 I recall sitting in Sochtem with six murderers in a, in a prison, and one of them was very aggrieved they'd been recalled uh, from their life parole uh, because they had been present while another murder was committed. I sort of understood that they didn't. Yes, no, that, you're absolutely correct. The, the basis for the decision is always risk, yeah. risk of harm to the public.
Can I just ask a final question, please? And that's, um, we've heard some concern about the fact that the requirement for a psychiatrist on the board mm -hmm. has been removed. Can I have your views on that, please? Um, <clears throat> we don't see a benefit necessarily in having a psychiatrist on the board. I think there was some supplementary written information given under, underlining some of the reasons for that. We had a recruitment round, including recruitment of psychiatrists 2016, uh, and we had two applicants. So there are not many psychiatrists out there who seem to be interested. We appointed one. Now, that one psychiatrist gives their availability and the scheduler tries to match that psychiatrist with cases which take place in secure hospitals. But it is not always the case uh, that the psychiatrist is available at the time the case needs to be dealt with. Uh, I, my, my view, and I think the view of the board, is that board members are perfectly capable of examining medical witnesses, cross-examining them if need be, and extracting the relevant information, requesting more if necessary, uh, and it's extracting evidence that the presence of a psychiatrist isn't always necessarily helpful. If I can give you a, a parallel, in criminal procedure, when a, an accused person defends a case on the basis that he was insane at the time of the crime, there's no suggestion, for example, that the jury can't decide the case and should have a psychiatrist on it, or that the judge ought to be a psychiatrist, or a psychiatrist ought to be asking the questions. It's all lay people who ask the questions. I'd be very disappointed if, if a tribunal of the board couldn't obtain the right kind of information of a doctor. And, and if they couldn't, then they'd be looking for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So it's the evidence and how you extract the evidence that's important rather than the identity of the question, it seems to me. I, I also think that... Um, Sometimes it's better if lay people ask the question, or non-medical people ask the questions. It's a bit like getting an IT expert to do your guidance material for a piece of electronic gubbins. It should be a complete idiot that does that. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me there's merit in exploring the evidence of a medical witness um, through lawyers and those with decades of experience in the criminal justice system. It's also the case that we have mental health professionals on the board, senior mental health professionals uh, on the board, and there are six of them, which allows a better spread of availability for cases in uh, secure hospitals. We also have cases which involve complex psychological reports, but there's never been a suggestion there should be a, a mandatory psychologist on the board. And I think the reason for that is that members are capable of exploring that evidence effectively. Okay, thank you. That, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, unless anyone has any other questions. That really brings us to the end of the, the, the session. Is there anything you'd like to say, just a, a final statement and, and your views on the bill and, and, and how, well, what direction it's going in? I, I don't think so, except to say that we see um, it very important that this legislation passes to provide us with a more structured framework within which to operate. Without it, we'll continue to, to swim upstream at times trying to pick the best route without any kind of framework within which to operate. Uh, and it seems to me that while the board's probably capable of doing it, we will continue to operate in, in a kind of isolation, and that context won't be available to, to the public and to practitioners who have to interact with the board. I think War Boys, as, as you may have pointed out, convener, is a classic example of misunderstanding, feeling some very, very destructive... Uh, media uh, comment and much of it ill informed. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes today's meeting. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, 5th of June, when we'll continue our evidence taking on the management of offenders bill. We'll also have an informal visit to Glasgow next week on the 29th of May. Thank you.